Right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our lecture on respiratory failure. Uh, the reason I go ahead and then I record this online so that you guys can listen to it in addition to the classroom setting is because it is a very long lecture uh, and in the classroom, even with the two hours, I don't always have the time to get through everything. So this is kind of something for you to build on, to add to what we've discussed, and to maybe even to clarify some concepts we've already gone over. So let's get started. If you guys would like to stop in the objectives, you're more than welcome to, but I'm going to move through these and the terms and the testing labs. I'm going to move through all this so we can get straight to what acute respiratory failure is. So we have four different kinds of acute respiratory failure, and we have previously talked about failure of ventilation, failure of oxygenation. We're going to understand the difference between those two. Failure of oxygen delivery and failure of cellular oxygen utilization. When we talk about respiratory failure in general, we are compromising one of these capacities and one of these functions in the body, and we need to immediately act on whatever is causing these issues Okay, intervene essentially so that we can prevent from further exacerbation of said condition. Let's start with failure of ventilation. Okay, so when we have a uh, ventilate, when we say the word ventilation, what I want you to think is adequate clearation of the CO2. Okay, so when the tissues are doing their thing, okay, and they're producing energy, and we have a byproduct, and we have that, that, that we've consumed oxygen, we now have carbon dioxide, we need to get it out of the body. Okay. So it's going to lead the cell, go back in through the capillaries, back into the venous system, and back through venous circulation to the heart and eventually pulmonary vasculature and out through the lungs is the idea. So when I say we have failure of ventilation, what we have is an inability to get that CO2 out of the body that has previously been produced in the tissues. Okay, uh, It can be caused by a variety of things, but typically it falls under airway obstruction, uh, airway depression, or respiratory depression. Sometimes pain and discomfort can also cause this. Uh, a perfect example would be a patient who's undergone maybe a surgery or has an abdominal blockage of some kind. And by abdominal, I mean more like a GI issue here. Uh, so they're taking short, shallow breaths. And those short, shallow breaths do cause a clearance issue and decrease CO2 output with each exhalation. So something to just kind of put in the back of your mind and think about as we move forward. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we have also failure of oxygenation. Okay. This happens when our O2 concentration in the arterial blood is decreased. Now, I'm just going to really quickly remind you our, our normal arterial blood gas or ABG would be a 7.35 to 7.45 pH, a carbon dioxide, so a PaCO2 of 35 to 45, a PaO2 for the oxygen of 80 to 100, and a bicarbonate level or HCO3 of 22 to 26. And some books say 22 to 27 or 28, and that's perfectly fine as well. Okay. So, what happens is, and the reason for this particular issue is I have a low fraction of oxygen that we're inhaling into the body, okay? I'm not getting enough volume. I'm not breathing enough. Uh, my VQ is mismatched. I have diffusion abnormalities. What I mean by diffusion abnormalities, and, and remember, diffusion is the concept of a higher pressure gradient down to a lower pressure because higher pressure always moves to an area of lower pressure. And the process of ventilation, as a reminder, is not you sucking air in so much as the inhalation process is an active process that consumes energy uh, via the contraction of your diaphragm and intercostals, which take pressure off your lungs and therefore decrease the pressure inside your lungs. When that pressure in your lungs is decreased, it is your, your pressure in your lungs is lower than atmospheric pressure, and therefore the atmosphere diffuses its high pressure into your lower pressure lungs. When you exhale, the process is simply reversed. Okay, Exhalation, once again, is a passive process. We do not consume energy to exhale. So the diaphragm is no longer contracting, it is relaxing. The intercostals are no longer contracting, they are relaxing down as well. They put back pressure on the lungs, so they come back down and put pressure on the lungs, increasing pressure inside the lungs. And then our pressure inside the lungs is now higher than it is in the atmosphere, and therefore, once again, diffusion takes place, boom. We push the pressure out of our lungs, and the cycle repeats every time you take a breath. And that's what's happening, okay? So we get this question, and I'm just going to touch on this really quick. One of the big questions I get is, you know, oxygen at higher levels in the atmosphere is decreased, and that's not true, really. Uh, it is at a point, but not, not anywhere where we're standing on solid ground. Um, that may be the case in the upper atmosphere, but down here on Earth, if you are standing on ground, the oxygen in the atmosphere around you is 21%. Okay, 
What does happen is the further you get away from sea level, you have decreased atmospheric pressure. So the oxygen is still 21% at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, at Mount Everest, at whatever mountain. But the problem is the pressure in the atmosphere around you when you inhale is lower. And because the pressure in the atmosphere is lower, you are getting less oxygen and less volume per breath. And that's where that oxygen deficit takes place. Fun fact. Anyway, <clears throat> causes of oxygenation failure, atelectasis, uh, lower collapse, pneumonia, COPD exacerbations, a big one, chronic bronchitis and emphysema there, uh, AL. I and ARDS, and then cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Anytime you fill the vasculature, of, excuse me, the uh, alveolus or lower airways with fluid, we're going to have that impairment of the ability of CO2 and O2 to exchange across the membrane. So then we have failure of oxygen delivery. I'm not going to ask you to understand that. Okay. Uh, but what I want to get after here is we have O2, but it's not getting where it needs to go. Where it needs to go is the tissues. So I have decreased cardiac output. Okay, it's because it's not getting to the tissues. And I have low arterial O2 content. Conditions, this can be caused by a, a variety of things. Um, particularly anemia is a big one. We have hypoxemia. Okay. And anemia in, uh, is something as simple as walking around with, with an iron deficiency can cause your body to have the inability to carry the oxygen that you have available. So it's not that we can't get oxygen into the lungs, it's literally that I do not have the capacity or my capacity is impaired to carry the oxygen to the tissues where it needs to go. So that's also a problem. And lastly, we have failure of cellular oxygen utilization. So we've got oxygen into the body, we've got CO2 out of the body, that's all good. But now we're on the cellular level, we're diffusing from the capillaries into the cellular tissues. And for some reason, we cannot utilize our oxygen. Uh, typically, when we get down to this level, and you're talking about impairments in ability to utilize oxygen, we're talking about impairments in the cell wall, we're talking about impairments in the mitochondria, we're talking about impairments of the cell in general, like infection, for example, or intoxication. Okay, so keep those in mind as we move forward, and we will talk about these more. So, let me pass that. We already know all this, we already know assessments. I will just close really quick. Type 1 ARF, acute respiratory failure. Okay, we're thinking ARDS and ALI, okay? I, hypoxemic acute respiratory failure is type one. Type two is hypoxemic and hypercarbic, meaning I'm retaining carbon dioxide, and this is where we fall into that COPD category for chronic bronchitis, specifically emphysema patients, okay? And then this is stuff that we can examine and see, and we need to test. You gotta actually have to, you have to differentiate, you know, type one and type two ARF. Uh, but the key here is if you look at your blood gas and you see that the patient is also retaining carbon dioxide instead of a 35 to 45, we have a 60, 70, 80. And that right there by itself in conjunction with hypoxemia is telling you we have a type 2 issue. So between that, chest x-rays and pulmonary measurements, pulmonary function tests, PF ratios, we can go ahead and delineate between the two. I'm not going to cover that. We're going to move past that. So I do want to talk about the COPD categories. Uh, <clears throat> so we have our chronic bronchitis. We often refer to these particular people as blue bloaters, and we'll show you why here in a minute. We have emphysema, and emphysema are our pink puffers. We'll talk about them as well. And then we have one that's kind of outside of the purview of the uh, two aforementioned is asthma. Okay, and this isn't one you really earn typically. This is typically one that's genetic. Uh, it kind of starts young in life, you know, childhood asthma, pediatric asthma into adulthood, which is possible. And adults can definitely have asthma, but typically it lessens in severity or goes away with age. Uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema are, and I, I don't want to call them earned conditions, but conditions that arise from abuse or uses of certain substances or environments. Um, so, you know, think cigarettes, think toba inhaled tobaccos, uh, inhaled anything, irritants of any kind. And that means, you know, a lot of your coal mine workers, lithium ion or lithium workers uh, sulfur workers and the list just keeps going any of these industries where you have aerosolization uh, or particulates in the air or dust you run the risk of also becoming a chronic bronchitis or emphysema patient depending on what is in your environment so let's move on so we'll talk, start with asthma we already know the etiology of asthma there's two kinds uh, eosinophilic and non eosinophilic so type 1 and non type 2 uh, we like to call them. You'll never see them in the hospital is non-type 2 asthma or type 1, 2 asthma. 
What you will see is eosinophilic measurements when we do our CVCs. And you can see, are my eosinophils elevated? If they are, then it's eosinophilic. And if it's not, then it's not eosinophilic. It's that simple. Okay. And what we're actually measuring here is the cell's response to a pathogen or an antigen specifically. And we're actually measuring what effects it had on these cells to create this response. And, I, you know, a, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, we have anaphylaxis and that's it. Well, anaphylaxis is in reference to a widespread systemic reaction to an antigen, an allergic reaction, if you will, a severe one. Asthma is very much the same in the eosinophilic capacity in that it is a cell-mediated response on the body in which we attack ourselves and our cells misfunction. So if there's anything I needed you to know about asthma and I asked you what it presented like, I would definitely need you to know, you know, reversible bronchospasms, but specifically here, and throw the word out reversible, we can reverse it sometimes, not all times, but bronchospasms and bronchoconstriction. We have airway narrowing and lower airway sounds such as wheezing, so that, that sound. Okay, we have prolonged expiration. Okay, so we can get air out over long periods of time, and we typically do because our body's going to start receiving CO2. So you end up with these periods of time where you're trying to exhale, but they're longer than typical. We have increased air trapping, difficulty breathing. We already know that. Use of accessory muscles, impaired cough with tenacious sputum, very thick, lots of mucus. Okay, the goblet cells get inflamed, and all of a sudden we have mucus throughout the entire airway. Excuse me. And then we go ahead and we have hypoxemia with or without hypercarbia, depending on what stage of the asthma attack or exacerbation that we're in. Okay. And the last thing is I need you to understand and know, wink, wink, shooting star, status asthmaticus, severe life-threatening presentation of asthma. People die from asthma all the time. It's one of those conditions, you know, you hear about it and you're like, oh, you have asthma. Okay, oh, well, you know, no big deal. Uh, but that's not entirely true. There are a lot of people that have asthma and... I hate to say it, some of the calls that get away from us sometimes, both in the field and what comes to the hospital, are asthma calls in which we look at the patient, we're like, oh, we'll just give them albuterol, that'll solve atrovent, that'll solve our problems. And then we do that, and it doesn't. Because when this starts occurring, you're, you're working against the clock, because if that airway completely closes off, I can get air in, but I can't get air out, and the patient becomes incredibly difficult to intubate, if at all, if you, if you can even get the tube. Um, so that's the consideration, and a lot of the people that I see in the field or in the hospital where we see severe asthma exacerbation in adults, we'll get, we'll get pretty aggressive with them and get to the intubation early uh, versus later. So uh, anyway, we have hyperreactivity, inflammation, mucosal edema, mucus hypersecretion, eosinophil or not, so there's that type 2, non-type 2. Um, the one here that I really want to touch on specifically is IgE. Okay, and IgEs and IgG measures a immunologic response to an antigen. So, in other words, when you have infections, when you have antigens, when you have immune responses of any kind, cell mediated responses, um, what ends up happening is we are looking at these values. And I'm not going to say we we just go straight. You know, come to the hospital asthma attack. Let's draw an IgE. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you can look at the immunoglobulin E response, and the more elevated it is, the more violent or severe the response likely was. So keep that in mind. But I really want you to be after the triggers, okay? Uh, and I, So with asthma, and the thing about it is there's a lot of things depending on the person's asthma. So what may exacerbate one condition may not exacerbate it for another individual. You may have people that are like, oh my gosh, dust in the air, I can't stand it. And they, they go to a desert environment and their asthma is miserable. Okay. <clears throat> Whereas they go to some place that's humid, they're fine. You know, not a lot of particulates in the air. The air is very heavy. The air is very moist. All right. Maybe they have problems during certain specific times of the year when there's a lot of pollen in the air. Really bad asthma issues. Okay. Uh, maybe they have issues with certain substances in the air, like hair, like chemicals, hairsprays, uh, teratogens, uh, carcinogenics, etc. All the whole list right there. But anyway, this is just showing your cell-mediated response in severe asthma. Um, I'm not going to go through it in detail. What you do need to see is it's, it's essentially antigen comes in, allergen slash pollutant comes into the, to the airway, okay, down into the trachea, down into the bronchi, the bronchioles. And what ends up happening is we have agitation of the epithelial tissues. And through a cell-mediated response, what ends up happening is that we have mast cells in IgE, 
okay, to begin to actually target our own cells. And mind you, epithelial cells include not just the cells that you have mucosal on or mucosa on them, but the goblet cells in the area as well. Uh, and what it causes is a bronchospasm slash constriction along with increased tenacious muc mucus production. So if I give you any medications, the medications are going to be aimed at inhibiting this system in some capacity. I will point out the SNS, the sympathetic nervous system, is the fight or flight system that responds when everybody's under attack. Um, the cool thing about it is when this system activates with an asthma attack, it actually does help to some extent, not, not fix it, but it does help prolong uh, severity of symptoms uh, or onset of severity uh, for a little while. You get that initial release of epinephrine and norepi, uh, which does help a little bit with bronchodilation and vasoconstriction, but the problem is it's not enough, okay? So this is where we come into play and we say, hey, we need stuff like albuterol, like a beta -A agonist. I need... I need something like Atrovent. I need steroids to decrease inflammation and swelling in the long term. But I will point out one thing, and because this response you know, results in activation of the SNS, one thing you never want to give an asthma patient is a beta blocker. You literally prevent the body from activating the sympathetic nervous system properties that would actually lessen the severity of an asthma attack. And that's pretty much the last thing you want to do. So... Put a, put a big pin slash star on that one. So there's our beta agonist, inhaled corticosteroids, uh, and then our anticholinergics, just suppressing mucus production. And that goes back to that SLUGEM, S-L-U-D-G-E-M acronym, SLUGEM. Let's talk about status asthmaticus. Okay, severe asthma attack, not responding to therapy, not responding to bronchodilators, going to result in ARDS, or excuse me, ARF, if left uninterrupted. Uh, increase, so pulmonary effects, increased airway resistance, increased residual volumes, hyperinflation, VQ mismatch, hypoxemia, cardiovascular, negative intrapural pressure, increase in venous return, pulling of the blood in the right ventricle because of that back pressure from the pulmonary system, increased work of the left ventricle, absolutely, and we're going to actually ask the heart for more. So we're increasing cardiac demand, but we're not increasing cardiac output at all because we have a lack of oxygen moving forward. So, good for that. Please keep these in mind. Ooh, which is the following medication should you be avoided in an asthmatic patient? We just talked about this. Which one? That's right. It's labetalol. There's our beta blocker. Stay away. Talk about chronic bronchitis. Let's do the etiology here. We're going to talk about smoking or prolonged exposure to uh, environmental factors and irritants. Again, think of miners, lithium, uh, lime, uh, coal, any kind of miner like that. Those are all irritants. In the environment where you work with aerosolized uh, chemicals where you're breathing them on the regular without proper respiratory protection. Uh, but anyway, productive cough with mucus that may be blood streaked. It's longer than three months, okay, times two years. All right. So when we have this greater than three months times two years, uh, we, what we're going to see in patients that have this is we're going to see our blue bloaters with difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, a chronic cough because they always have mucus secretion and production moving its way into the lower airway, okay? So we have uh, a noisy chest as well. Sometimes you're going to hear coarse crackles, maybe even a rattle. And a lot of the books nowadays are saying ronchi and crackles are interchangeable. And it's because we are moving towards fine crackles. And that's that Rice Krispies, I just poured milk in you kind of crackle. Really fine, like bubble wrap, cracking and popping it. And then we have our coarse crackles. And our coarse crackles fall under a category very similar to ronchi. And then we have thick, tenacious mucus. Um, it's like blowing bubbles in molasses or syrup, if you will. Uh, the thing about it is, and there's this common misconception that also crackles are wet. And with fine crackles, that is true. However, with coarse crackles, that is not always true. And I'm not saying the chronic bronchitis isn't wet. I'm just saying be aware there's a very different noise sound between a you know fine crackle, bubbly poppy, uh, versus, say, a coarse crackle or even ronchi, where it's more of a rattle, a deep, bubbly rattle. And you can have the rattles related to pneumonia and have them be completely dry. No production of mucus, barely at all. So, and again, I'm not saying that's the only thing we're going to look at, but it's something to be aware of. Okay. 
Uh, we also have hypoxemia. We have hypercarbia, CO2 retention. Absolutely. They're going to be, they live in a persistent state of hypercarbia. DQ mismatching. Once again, we have cyanosis and there's our blue bloaters title. Decrease uh, in expired volumes. Okay. And then we have our compensatory polycythemia, which is second degree chronic hypoxia. So the body gets used to living in this state of hypoxia, in this state of hypercarbia. So what does it do? It compensates. And typically we see a rise in hemoglobin production uh, to compensate, carry more oxygen. But the problem isn't that we have or need more oxygen for that matter, so much as it is we need to get more of our CO2 out. Then we have our right side of heart failure in the form of core pulmonale. Okay, and then recurrent viral bacterial infections. Think about it. Bacteria, mm, they love moist, warm environments. This patient is not only got warm and moist inside their lungs, they have mucus entrapment warm and moist. And the thing about mucus is that it traps bacteria, allows it to grow protected from your immune system pretty darn well. So that's a bad thing. Okay. Here's our second degree hypoxemia. And you'll see it. This is called clubbing. If you ever see this on a patient, typically you see it on patients that are a bit older. You don't see it on young patients. This right here indicates their body is used to living life in a state of nonstop hypoxia. Okay, and part of that compensatory mechanism is the misshapen extremities here. Then, like I said, the polycythemia. So we're going to see some changes, some physiological changes. Normal bronchus, nice and dilated. Okay, we're open. I should say the lumen is open. Okay, looks good, looks healthy. I like it. Nice and thin. Now on the right here, we see chronic bronchitis or bronchitis in general. Thickened wall of the bronchi or bronchi bron bronchiole, excuse me. Inflammation of the interior of the bronchus, causing swelling and inflammation and increased production from the goblet cells and the mucosal lining. Okay, so what's happening is we're not only do we have increased mucus production, there's one more thing we have that we don't talk about very often, and that's mucociliary lining damage. And what ends up happening is much like your GI tract would move things through your GI if those cili, or excuse me, the microvilli in your GI tract become paralyzed, you can't move stuff. Likewise, when mucociliary linings are damaged and ciliary function is impaired, you have a hard time getting things up and out of your lungs, hence the persistent cough and never having cleared the airway. We have a lot of stagnant volume in the lung now, and that creates a perfect environment for in infection. So uh, I'm just going to summarize this slide for you. Uh, so what this is saying is people that have more and more and more COPD exacerbations have an increasing risk of mortality as compared to those that have fewer exacerbations. That's what we're saying here. Um, the more, and the thing about it is, chronic bronchitis isn't one of those conditions that just magically starts getting better. It doesn't improve over time. Typically, whatever has caused chron chron chronic bronchitis, those exacerbations three or more months over a two-year span, uh, those don't usually get better. Uh, due to the causes being permanent in the long term. So what happens is with each exacerbation, our patients have decreased survivability and increased uh, risk of death. Uh, and you can see here the chart's just saying that people with the highest rate of death or survivability, or the least survivability, were people that had more than three acute exacerbations uh, in a window of time ranging from zero to 60 months. So pretty substantial drop off there if you really look at it. So keep that in the back of your head. And then I know COPD and even CHF exacerbation, um, it doesn't sound terrible when you just say the word exacerbation. You, you hear myocardial infarction, you're kind of like, ah. You know, you hear COPD and you're just like, oh yeah, you smoked, okay, cool. When you hear exacerbation, you're like, oh, your, your smoking condition got worse. Problem is these conditions are actually really life-threatening if you're not careful. And ARF is very real and very quick and can kill. So, hey, look, a blue bloater. <laughs> they didn't put a filter on this image at all to make it bluer. But this is definitely a blue bloater. He doesn't really have the clubbing. and Not that you can tell that well, but you can definitely see that cyanosis, that persistent state of hypoxia this gentleman lives in. Uh, we won't even talk about that. That's a, probably a different thing altogether. Uh, but anyway, you see our gentleman here is dis miscolored, misshapen, holds CO2. Activity and tolerance are probably really bad. So, blue bloaters. Let's talk about emphysema. This is our third condition under the COPD umbrella. Okay. Uh, you're sm you smoked. And not necessarily that you smoked. I hate that it only lists smoking. Uh, by the way, if you have teratogenic, a carcinogenic, or you have inhalants, 
in the environment in which you work, live, whatever the case may be, and they can break down or have the potential to break down connective tissue, then those two could also cause emphysema. It's just the occurrence of that being the cause of emphysema is incredibly rare. Hands down, like number one cause, smoke, no doubt. Uh, clinical features, quiet chest. It really does sound like your breath sounds are very far away when you oscillate them. And you can hear a variety of breath sounds because the airway is pretty upset. And typically, and I, by the way, it's not too often you don't see emphysema with some kind of bronchitis in the history or in the current. Um, so that's also a thing. But anyway, we can hear wheezes, crackles, and fine crackles because fluid retention is a thing. Sounds like the lung sounds are very far away or even diminished. They have hyperresonance when you're going to percuss. Increased AP diameter. Normal AP diameter should be 2 to 1. Okay. These AP diameters are more rounded. So an AP diameter, anterior posterior diameter on your chest, we typically have 2 wide, 1 deep. So whatever the width of your, your uh, chest, thoracic cavity is, typically you're half that depth deep, meaning front to back. That's not the case with these particular patients. These particular patients definitely have more of a barrel shape. They're, they're more rounded in the thoracic cavity. Uh, ABGs typically are normal in the early stages, but when we get into moderate and severe cases, that's when we start seeing those ABG abnormalities. Retention of, of CO2 and lack of O2, and we'll talk about that more. Accessory muscle use, purse lip breathing, they're tachypnic. They sit in that tripod position because, man, does it help, and I'll explain that in a second. We have VQ mismatching, decreased volumes and expiratory volumes with high, like, retention. Um, so we can get air in. We can't get it back out very well, and for that reason, people automatically extend their exhalation period slightly. Sputum is scanty, often thin, malnourished, cachectic. Why? Because their body's working overtime to breathe, get more oxygen, get more CO2 out, but the problem is, every time you take a breath in, it's an active process, we consume energy. Well, if you're in a persistent state of tachypnea, your body is working overtime just to breathe 24-7. And because it is an active process, we consume far more energy, far more calories, at a much more rapid pace, which is something you definitely need to think about. This condition also has compensatory polycythemia. Uh, you may just want to hold on to that piece of information, keep that in your head. Both chronic bronchitis and emphysema have uh, compensatory polycythemia. Asthma does not. We have two kinds. We have centrolobular, and that's tobacco use. We have panlobular, associated with alpha antitrypsin deficiency. This one, I do not see this very often. I've personally never even cared for a patient with this condition alone. And honestly, if I'm being quite frank, in the hospital setting, you will not see, unless you're in a pulmonology unit specializing in the treatment of ARF or ARDS, you're never going to see a doctor's note or diagnosis officially say centrolobular type versus panlobular type. Um, I will admit, I probably at some point cared for an individual suffering from panlobular emphysema, alpha antitrypsin deficiency, which is a genetic condition and starts the degradation of connective tissues in the alveolus at a very young age throughout the lifespan. Whereas centrolobular type is something the more tobacco you use, the more cigarettes you smoke, the faster you break down that connective tissue. Okay. Uh, we have enlarged distal airways that are typically dilated, and by enlarged distal airways, I mean specifically the very end of the bronchioles and the alveolus. The alveolus, not only are they dilated usually and enlarged, they actually become destroyed, and instead of looking like this cluster of berries or like a raspberry that has all these small clusters, it starts looking like one big berry, big bulging walls, and that's a bad thing. And you're like, oh, well, I have more surface area now to exchange CO2 and O2. That should be better, right? Wrong. And I'll show you that in a second. Because of the connective tissue breakdown surrounding the alveolus, we have a loss of elastic recoil, okay? And we rely on that elastic recoil to get carbon dioxide out. I'll explain that too. Hyperinflation leads to reduction in gas exchange. You better believe it, and bull-eye formation is common. Let's get to a pink puffer. Here's my gentleman. You can see it. Look at that AP diameter. Definitely not a endoron. He's wide, but you can see how bulged forward his rib cage is. More barrel-like. Worn out. Tired. Look at that tripod position. Most people don't understand your body has it wired into like the brain and the central nervous system. It's like it's actually pretty pretty well wired. And it goes, oh goodness gracious me, oh my, I uh, I uh, I'm a little short on oxygen. I have a tid much too much CO2. I really should probably breathe faster. Ooh, ooh, I should also increase my volume. Well, I'm already getting a workout, so how else can I increase tidal volumes per breath? 
what we can do is we can put our arms up on the sides and we actually push up. And you can see where his shoulders are even sitting up here. And by doing so, we take just a little more pressure off the thoracic cavity and the lungs specifically, allowing for increased inflation. This works wonders if you have lungs that recoil normally. Believe it or not, this position actually in the long run makes things worse for this patient because once again, we have that expansion of the alveolus in the lower airway, but we have no recoil of the alveolus in the lower airway. So let's take a peek really quick at chronic bronchitis. Uh, and let's take a peek really quick at emphysema in picture form. So we have excess mucus, okay, right there. We have the airway, but you look at the alveolus and okay, they're pretty normal. Problem is, this excess mucus works its way down in the bronchioles and alveolus, and it actually impairs the ability of them to exchange CO2 and O2. So yes, they retain their form, that's great, but the problem is that mucus gets in the way and it prevents exchange of gas. Emphysema, okay, we have a collapsed bronchial or enlarged bronchial, okay, look at the thickness of that lumen, down into what are no longer little berry-like clusters, just kind of like cotton ball shaped looking things. And this is bad. This is really bad. And they don't expand, contract, expand, contract. These do. These will inflate a little, contract a little, inflate a little, contract a little. And that's based on inhalation and exhalation. And that helps the passage of CO2 and O2 across the capillary membrane via diffusion. Okay. So we come over here and we look at this picture. And yeah, you still have blood vessels all around this, but the connective tissue is broken down. I have expansion, but none or very limited contraction of the alveolus. And therefore, I, I'm having a hard time with pressure systems, and I can't get CO2. And so imagine, if you will, with this condition, I have a bus that comes through. We call that bus, bus the red blood cell. Okay, it comes through the heart, into the lungs, into the pulmonary vasculature. There's 20 seats on that bus, and they're all currently full of blue people. We call CO2. So that blue people need to get off the bus. And normally, in a human being, like you or I, and if you are healthy, it would offload, get off the bus, and boom, we'd load the red people on the bus, and we call them oxygen. Okay. What happens here, though, is the little red blood cell comes in. Okay. We come into the, to the capillary bed surrounding the alveolus. And we say, all right, everybody off. You know, all 20 CO2, get off the bus so we can get some new passengers on here. And all 20 CO2 try to fit out the same exact little door on that bus all at the same time. But the problem is you can only get so much CO2 through an area of space at a time. And because the alveolus is dilated or enlarged, it actually decreases the amount of CO2 able to pass for off the bus and into what would be the alveolus and out of the lungs for exhalation. So eventually the CO2 is like, I'm just going to stay. And yeah, maybe you get some off. Let's, like, let's say 10 of them get off the bus. Normally 20 would have gotten off, so that's only half of what I normally would do. So 10 get off the bus and 10 go sit back down in their seats. So here comes, you know, your red peoples or your oxygen. And they walk onto the bus and they go to sit. But there's only 10 seats. Well, that's a problem. Okay, so 10 get on the bus and that's still some oxygen. But I would normally have a lot more, uh, double the oxygen. And again, I'm not saying you have 20 oxygen and 20 carbon dioxide on and off. That's not what I'm saying. These are just numbers to give you a loose idea of how this process works. So, in other words, emphysema and chronic bronchitis serve to inhibit the ability of carbon dioxide to even get off the bus. Okay. And so what ends up happening is if I have less seats on the bus, that means I have less oxygen carrying capability. The less oxygen I carry, the less oxygen makes it to the tissue. I decrease the ability and functionalities of the tissue. And I also decrease a very important cycle inside the mitochondria that creates ATP reliant on the presence of oxygen, glucose, and H2O. So you're burning more calories. And that's, that's the thing about that. Metabolically, I'm burning more calories, breathing much more, contracting much more but I'm actually producing substantially less ATP because of a lack of oxygen and a persisting state of carbon dioxide. It's a vicious cycle. Okay, I'm sorry I talked about that enough. Chest x-rays, I love chest x-rays. When I first started out, I had no clue how to really look at these. By the way, this is an amazing chest x-ray. People look at it and they're like, ew, what's that? This is actually a very good chest x-ray in the sense that I want to see these open, clear, fields and I want to see these silhouettes of the airway and over here in the mediastinum where the heart is the cardiac silhouette I want to be able to see that okay and the more clear and black this is the better 
because it means there's less. And again, obviously, I'm not saying you can see through ribs. This whole thing will never be totally black. If it is, you uh, have no ribs. That's not a bad thing. So, but the more concentrated a tissue is, the whiter it appears on an X-ray. So if you look at these tissues: shoulder blades, clavicles, ribs, etc. And by the way, you can see them back there. Uh, here's the mediastinum. It just lights it off. Dense tissue. Okay, but your lungs should have open open sections of decreased density in tissue, and that's what gives you these beautiful black silhouettes in which I'm like, oh man, look at those are all the way inflated. I love the way they look. They look great. Okay. Now, as if someone gets an infection, bacterial, viral, fungal, whatever, and they get pneumonia, what we end up seeing is an increase in like white cloudy substances because of increased tissue density inside the lung, or even you can see fluid. It kind of shows up as like a gray. And those are all bad things. So these are some of the tests we do. Uh, PFTs, chest x-rays, that's a big one. Chest CTs, also a big one. Usually chest x-rays do the trick. Chest CTs are more specific imaging. And we have arterial blood gases. Okay. These right here are overinflated lungs. And I can see that. Okay. It's what you would see in a chronic bronch. Excuse me. I um, apologize. Emphysema patient. Uh, what I mean by they look amazing is that they are clear. Okay. All right, so how do we manage COPD? Sit them upright. For the love of God, do not lay your COPD patients, especially chronic bronchitis or heart failure in conjunction with COPD, do not lay these patients down. Sit them up at roughly 45 degrees. They will like that. Okay. You have to be careful with oxygen therapy. Oxygen therapy can have the reverse desired effects in patients with chronic bronchitis emphysema in that hyperoxygenating them, giving them high flow oxygen, giving them increased concentration of oxygen can actually knock out their respiratory drive. Because remember, your central nervous system isn't monitoring O2, it's monitoring CO2. So when you have too much CO2, your brain goes, eh, breathe faster. Okay. Well, when I don't have enough CO2, my body goes, oh, breathe slower. I need to hold on to some of that. Let me, let me get some more of that back. And it's not that your central nervous system isn't paying attention to O2. It just puts an emphasis on CO2. So the last thing you'd want to do with an emphysema or chronic bronchitis patient is have them come in. They're like, yeah, I'm just, I have some difficulty uh, breathing. And oh, yeah, whoo, ah, whoo. Uh, and then you're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to hit you with a non-breather mask at 15 liters. High, you know, I'm going to hit you with some high flow, some BiPAP, whatever the case may be, at 100%. I can guarantee you, you will hyperoxygenate your patient. You will dump your carbon dioxide levels temporarily, resulting in the body going, oh, God, stop breathing. Stop, 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 or slow way down. And that's a bad thing. Do I want their breathing to slow down if they're in the 40s, 50s? Yes. But I don't want their breathing to slow down to 0 or 8 or 10. Okay. And not just that, these patients, when they come in, they're breathing shallow and they're breathing rapid. So it's, <laughs> the more shallow the respiration, the less tidal volume that we're getting in, less oxygen is coming in, but also the less CO2 is going out. Yes, breathing faster, increasing the rate does blow off more CO2. However, if the breath or the exhalation period becomes shortened, you're not really blowing off that much excess CO2. One of the best things you can do with these patients, and it's going to sound real weird, is try to coach them to slow their respiratory rate down and take deeper breaths. Believe it or not, and I would say, if I had to put a number on it, and again, this is a guesstimate here, I'd say about 80% of the patients that come into me with COPD exacerbations if I can get them to follow me, and that's the if part, that's really challenging, a lot of psychological stress on them here. They feel like they can't breathe, they're suffocating, so it's hard for them to really calm themselves down. But if you can get them to follow you and breathe with you and slow, and again, sure. So still fast, but nowhere near as fast as they were breathing prior and we're going to increase that tidal volume, get more CO2 out, increase the O2 carrying capabilities just pass passively. And yes, I'm not saying don't give them oxygen, but maybe start out with like a nasal cannula. Remember, on these patients, we are not hunting to get them back to 96 SpO2. Patients with chronic COPD, specifically emphysema and chronic bronchitis, not asthma, live in a persistent state of hypoxia. 
for them, and I, this is going to sound crazy, but do your research, them being in SPO2 of 89, 88, 89 to 92, that might actually be where they live. And this is where we go back to that very first week of lecture. Don't treat the monitor. Treat the patient. If a patient is sitting there eating their Jello, their chocolate pudding, mixing their chocolate and vanilla pudding together, making sundaes, ordering bananas on the TV, and chocolate sundaes and pudding, but they're asymptomatic and satting 88 with good waveform, I'm not that concerned. And the reason I'm not that concerned is they stay here. This is where they live. Their body's compensated on its own already without my intervention. That being said, if I see the same exact thing, minus ordering bananas, sundaes, and ice cream and pudding, and I see 88, waveform's good, and I see they are symptomatic, meaning they're breathing really fast, they look distressed, they look fatigued, they're worn out. If I see those things, and that's where I, I step into the realm of starting with some, some light, some mild supplemental oxygen in the form of a nasal cannula between two to six liters. Uh, wink, wink, shooting star with this info, fun fact, uh, your nasal cannula provides you 24 to 44% FiO2, okay, in addition to environmental. But the idea is breathing through your nose, utilizing a nasal cannula gives you an FiO2 overall of 21 to, four, excuse me, 24 to 44% at flow rates of one to six or two to six, depending on what book you read. So for testing purposes, mine will be 24 to 44, uh, 2 to 6 liters nasal cannula. Okay, that's where we want to start. Uh, pursed lip breathing, another one. Uh, you can have them blow into like a bag or like, and here's a big one. And I love this. I do it all the time again. So, all right, I couldn't get you to follow me. I couldn't get you to count breaths with me. I couldn't get you to listen to me. That's okay. You're stressed out. You're panicked. You're anxious. I get it. I would be too if I felt like I was suffocating and sitting there. Uh, one of the big things I like to do is I like to take a 50, 50, ML syringe, I'll pull out the plunger, and I'll actually tell them to blow out through from the large bore end, out through the, the small bore end, and that, believe it or not, actually further inflates their alveolus and allows for better exchange of CO2 and O2 in the short term, which may be just enough to decrease the severity or even resolve an exacerbation condition, depending on what causes it. Okay. Uh, coughing technique, suction if necessary, of course, uh, postural drainage, percussion, per respiratory muscle training, all of these absolutely are things that need to be done really quick. So when we talk about nursing management, nursing diagnoses, the two go-to ones, did I skip past it? I skipped past it. I did. <laughs> two go-to ones, hands down, are um, impaired gas exchange and ineffective airway clearance. I'm not a huge fan of ineffective breathing patterns. Don't like that one at all. Uh, not only is it non-descriptive, uh, not only is it inconsistent, it's one of the least useful nursing diagnoses I've ever used in my life. I definitely like going down the pathway of ineffective airway clearance because it's persistent, it's chronic, it's, cons it's always there. And impaired gas exchange. So you have two of these nursing diagnoses that exist at all times with these COPD patients, minus asthma. Okay. What do we do? More ventilation, more oxygenation within reason without displacement of carbon dioxide. We want to slow the disease process or lessen the symptomology. And we want to prevent any exacerbations or any complications. Perfect example, I don't really want you to have an asthma attack, so I give you corticosteroids, preventative measures, prophylactic measures. I don't want you to have worsening chronic bronchitis, so I tell you, hey, get your pneumococcal vaccine, get your flu vaccine. You know, steer clear of areas where people might be sick. We just had COVID. COVID came through and was a interesting beast to say the least. Uh, we always thought, oh, it's a respiratory, it's, it's a, re COVID is purely respiratory. Come to find out later, it is not a respiratory infection isolated. It is something much broader and systemic and affects all systems of the body. So that's a different story for a different day. We'll talk about that more later. But preventing worsening of COPD and emphysema specifically. Okay. Uh, these patients may be uh, malnourished. They may have fluid deficits and electrolyte deficits. You do need to manage them, okay? They may need cardiovascular support. They may need blood pressure support. Uh, typically, they're tachycardic, okay? Because remember, increased cardiac demand, decreased cardiac output because I'm hypoxic. It's a vicious cycle. Uh, in extreme cases, and I've had patients come in and they come in with a mild COPD exacerbation, but they're freaking out and you can't calm them down. 
Um, in this particular instance, <coughs> excuse me, you may want to consider a sedative or an anxiolytic. Okay. Now, obviously, we have long-term acting anxiolytics. Uh, we have a lot of your psychiatric and psychotropic medications, like Boost Bar is a very common one you'll see prescribed to patients with anxiety. Propranolol is another one. But again, propranolol or Indorol is a beta blocker, and we do not give beta blockers to asthmatics. We can give it to other people. You can give it to patients with chronic bronchitis or emphysema, but not to asthmatics. Okay. Then we have our anxiolytics uh, again, and this falls into our barbiturates category. Excuse me, I said barbiturates. Please don't give your patients barbiturates if they're anxious. That's a lie. Let's try it again. Benzodiazepines. I knew it started with a B. So benzodiazepines, and this is where your Xanax and your Ativan, so your Alprazolam and your Lorazepam come into play. And again, you may see a 0.5 milligram dose of Ativan, you know, Q1 hour PRN for anxiety related to COPD exacerbation. That's a very real order. You may see even prophylactic uh, treatment for some physicians that are very aggressive with severe COPD or severe anxio, anxio, anxious exacerbation. You may even see 0.25 alprazolam TID, not PRN. Okay, or even 0.5, depending on the size of the patient and severity of anxious symptoms. So, if a patient has long-term anxiety in conjunction with COPD, it can obviously make the condition far, far worse. And now we not only have a physiologic component from a pulmonary standpoint, but we also have another component from a psychological standpoint in need of address. And this is where we start tying in psychiatry and medications again, like Zoloft and Boost Bar in the long term. And again, Xanax if needed, or you know, Ativan if needed. But again, this is you're talking advanced medication management from a psychiatric provider here. So just keep it in the back of your head. So if you have that patient, COPD, super anxious, maybe they just need something to help them calm down a little bit. All right, moving on. Uh, let's do preventative management and discharge planning together. Okay, obviously these patients are at high risk and predominantly your, your bron chronic bronchitis. Asthma too, emphysema as well. But your chronic bronchitis patients are at highest risk of exacerbation related to an opportunistic infection. You want to educate the patient. Stay away from sick people. If you go out, make sure you're wearing a mask, if possible. I think what you just asked them to do, wear a mask. Hmm. Likely not going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. But get that flu vaccine annually. Get the pneumococcal vaccine per CDC guidelines, recommendations. Talk to your primary care provider. Okay. When they get infections, we don't care if they're viral. We don't care if they're bacterial. And again, yes, antibiotics only directly attack bacteria. But we don't care. They're going to get medication management in the form of antibiotics purely because many viral infections lead to opportunistic bacterial infections in the form of pneumonia. So not only are we giving these prophylactically, but we're also, if there is any bacteria that are currently present, also attacking the immune system and weakening it, this will actually help support the immune system to fight a viral attack as well. Not fighting virus with antibiotics, that's not what we're doing. Purely prophylactic, or we're supporting the immune system, getting rid of bacterial attackers, decreasing any kind of strain on the immune system so it itself can work on fighting a viral infection. That's the, the thought here. So, medications we will definitely use. We have our beta agonists, not antagonists, not beta blockers. Albuterol and Solmetrol. Okay, these are our rescue inhalers, quick acting. If you have an asthma attack and you're like, I can't breathe and there's wheezing involved, boom, albuterol, right off the bat. Bam, bam. Okay. We have our anticholinergics, or atrovent, also known as ipratropium. Okay. That's going to suppress the mucal secretion into the airway. We have methylxanthines and theophylline. We have corticosteroids, and then we have antibiotics. And those pretty much all together fall into a category of prophylaxis, preventative measures, especially the corticosteroids and antibiotics, absolutely. Um, it's not a universal treatment, but another one that they don't mention here is expectorants. Um, you know, we have our, our Robitussin. Uh, we have a, a very common one we like to give in the hospital setting. Um, drawing a blank at the moment, drawing a blank, smells like eggs, gosh darn it, that one escaped me, uh, anyway, so we have different expectorants in the hospital, oh, 
Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so the one I'm thinking of in the hospital is acetylcysteine. And then we have mucolytics, such as bromohexine, if I remember right, uh, carbocysteine. And then our expectorants were like the guafenicin. Uh, even Benadryl has properties that suppress uh, cholinergic responses and therefore can be utilized as expectorants as well. So, sorry about that. Keep those in the back of your mind. Self-care, what do we do? Please stop smoking for the love of God. Exercise within reason. Do not exacerbate yourself by exercising to the extreme. Talk to your primary care provider. Find a common ground to stand on and a workout plan. You know, where do I want to be? Find that place. Proper nutrition. Substantial increase in protein and calories. And not empty calories. I am not telling you to tell your patient, yeah, you need way more calories. Well, soda has calories. I'll just drink a gallon of that. Not what I'm saying. We definitely need more protein. When I say protein... We're talking lean protein. We're talking in, in the case of a like chronic bronchitis patient. In a emphysema patient, we actually need fattier proteins. We need those calories. So believe it or not, and actually, and, and I know it sounds silly, that is the difference between you know chronic bronchitis patients having chicken breast, very lean with decent co decent protein concentrations. Okay. Whereas I'd be advising someone with emphysema to have chicken thighs. Okay. Uh, again, good meat, rich in iron, rich in, in ferrous sulfate, uh, but it has an increased fat concentration, and therefore an increased caloric value. Uh, ideally, those are okay choices, but our best choice would definitely be like fish, if they can tolerate it, and not just any fish, not deep fried fish, not fish and chips. No, I'm talking about like salmon. You want those rich omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Those are good choices, excellent protein sources, and increased calories, but different kinds of fat that break down better in your body. Okay. Avoid any inhaled irritants. Get your flu shot and pneumococcal vaccine. Make sure you're conducting regular checkups. So, really quick, which of the following is the last choice for every management in a COPD patient? Just set it. Which one's the last choice? Should be. We don't want to innovate. The absolute last choice for a COPD patient with chronic bronchitis or um, emphysema would be innovation. Asthma is not the case here. Okay. Asthma. There's nothing wrong with innovating that patient early. Uh, that is, that's a different, different, different. It's why I don't like asthma being clumped in with COPD. Uh, if I had to give you the progression of airway man or excuse me, oxygen management in ARF, we would definitely, with our COPDs, chronic bronchitis, and eczema, start low, nasal cannula, venturi mask, simple mask, then we go and graduate to like a high flow mask, high flow nasal cannula, uh, non breathers, and then above that's our CPAP and BiPAP, okay, that's like right below intubation. And then we have our intubation and our full ventilatory management. We'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. Uh, this is the high flow nasal cannula. Think of it as a leaf blower for your nostrils. And what I mean by that is there is, and this guy's smiling. He's lying. This isn't on. This is all a lie. I don't like it. Okay. I don't think I've ever looked at a patient unless they're on a very low setting and had them smiling like this. Oh, yeah, that's so much better. I can breathe now. No. Usually what I end up seeing is I see a patient with this in their nares. They're like, hey, I got to get this off. It's really uncomfortable. I don't like the way it feels. It's really hurting my nose. And the reason it's hurting, uh, on the lower end, you'll see devices like these flowing at 40 to 80 liters per minute. Uh, some machines only go to 40 to 60, and that's fine too. But 40 to 80 liters per minute in that ballpark. Think about that. 40 liters of air moving through your nares per minute like that's a lot 40 liters a tidal volume for you is 50 or 500 mls you take 12 to 20 breaths per minute even on the high side you're only taking in 10,000 mls and 10,000 mls is 10 liters you're taking in under normal respiratory conditions between 6,000 to 10,000 mls so 6 to 10 liters of airflow for a normal person, just chilling, just taking some breaths, this thing's cranking out 40 to 80 liters. Four to eight times the normal volume is passing through this bad boy. And not even into your mouth, into your nose. 
So for that reason, we take some precautions here. One, we humidify the air to not just dry out the mucosal membranes and nares or the nasopharynx. Okay, that's one. And two, we actually manage temperature circuits with these because if you don't manage the temperature circuit and the air is hot, the faster the air blows across the mucosal membrane, it can actually cause burns. And no, I don't mean like I held a lighter to my hand burn. I mean what is the equivalent of a light friction burn on the inside of the nares. Either way, incredibly uncomfortable. Make sure you're paying, oh, I hate this. This drives me insane. My pet peeve of mine, I'll put it out there. I hate it when I walk into a room and I hear boop, 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 Or I hear like boop, 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 boop. Because that tells me either my ventilator, my my BiPAP, my high flow nasal cannula is out of fluid. Okay, we use sterile water in these. Same with BiPAP and, and our ventilatory systems. Sterile water. So I walk in and that's sitting there and, and they beeps for a long time. Maybe RT's busy. Maybe they're off doing something. But then nurses just stare and stare at it like it's magically going to fix itself or when two, three hours and the RT comes back by, it'll be fine. The entire time the patient's sitting there with no oxygen, excuse me, no humidification, it's incredibly uncomfortable if these are flowing at high rates. And the same with BiPAP, the same with the ventilator, incredibly uncomfortable and bad for the tissue lining as well. So if you see that, please just take care, like communicate with your RT, get some sterile water, refill. Here we have our bi-level ventilation. We have an inspiratory and an ex respiratory pressure phase okay see it covering the nares and the mouth you will see cpap continuous positive airway pressure set at a specific pressure and continuously forcing air into the lungs with the idea of increasing infl in inflammation uh, increasing inflation of the alveolus and pushing any fine fluids out of the alveolus bed and back into the capillary circulature around them whereas bipap we get nose and mouth CPAP would only cover one or the other, only the nose or only the mouth, typically the nose. All right, let's go ahead and talk about intubation. So in certain instances, there will be times when we will have to intubate a patient. Okay, and what you see here, and I want you to understand what these devices are, is this is a laryngoscope. Most common are Mac and Miller blades. They are two different blades. So you have a Mac blade and a Miller blade, okay, with different sizes. We'll talk about those shortly. We have our ET tube. And the ET tube goes through the oropharynx down past the epiglottis into the through the vocal cords and into the trachea, or past the larynx, I should say, I suppose. And then we have our NG tube. Okay, and it could also be an OG tube that we're going to insert, and this is going to go down into the gastric cavity, specifically the stomach, and that can help us uh, aspirate gastric contents, tube feedings, etc. Anyway, uh, on right here, this little piece is the balloon inflator, because if you look distally on the cuff here, or excuse me, distally on the ET tube, you will see there is a little cuff that holds about 5 ml of air, and we inflate that to secure it in the trachea. Okay. This is a ventilator, and you definitely need to be familiar with these different types of settings. We have two different settings that are most common. We have volume control and pressure control. Our volume control allows us to set four specific parameters, and you must know these. These are test questions, I can guarantee it. So volume control, I need to set my tidal volume per breath. So for example, like 400 to 500 would be common. Okay, set my rate. So how many of these do I want to deliver? So I'm going to deliver 10 to 12 breaths, maybe more, at a set rate. And then I'm going to also give a set volume. Okay. So then I have my FiO2 and I have my PEEP. And my PEEP, okay, is a value. And what PEEP stands for? Excuse me. Uh, anyway, back to where I was. PEEP stands for peak and expiratory pressure, and that's how much pressure we're applying to the patient, okay? And when we apply more pressure to the patient, we inflate the alveolus and distal portions of the lung more, okay? It's like it's like taking a balloon that's only half full and trying to fill it all the way, so we get better O2 and CO2 exchange across the membrane. So once again, the four components of volume control, tidal volume, rate, PEEP, and FiO2. FiO2 is how much oxygen we're giving the patient. Then we have our pressure control settings. 
the five parameters that we are manipulating for pressure control are rate, okay, so same thing as AC. AC, by the way, is volume. Okay, so the pressure control, or PC, we're doing rate, inspiratory pressure, inspiratory time, also known as I time, PEEP, and FiO2. So normal settings for a pressure vent might read, for example, a rate of 16 to 18, and I mean, these aren't normal ranges, I'm just I'm saying what it might read like. So like 16, uh, pressure of 22, or inspiratory pressure of 22, eye time of one, oops, excuse me, eye time of 1.0, uh, peep of eight, uh, FiO2 80%. For, that's, that's an example, okay. We have different modes, and FiO2 is how much oxygen I'm giving you, peep is how much pressure I'm putting in per breath. Mode is my assist control, okay. So in other words, <clears throat> I'm in charge, I'm gonna breathe for you if you're not breathing. However, maybe you just need a little bit of effort, help, maybe you're already breathing on your own pretty well. So what this, is, this mode does is it actually senses if you need a little bit of extra pressure slash volume. And then when, when you start taking a breath, it just adds, it's almost like BiPAP-ish-esque, if you will, in that it just gives you a little boost and assistance and makes it easier to breathe and takes pressure off your diaphragm and intercostals. SIMV is more of a workout mode. And what I mean by that is uh, it allows us to actually let you breathe. Okay, so I'm going to deliver 12 breaths per minute. I'm going to give you this much volume, but... If you'd like to breathe over me, you're more than welcome to. And what that does is it gives the patient the opportunity, rather than just relying solely on the ventilator, if they have their own spontaneous respiratory drive, it allows them to exercise it. Okay, so if, I, again, I set you at 10 or 12 breaths per minute at this volume, I'm going to let you breathe. All of a sudden, you're like, no, I'd rather breathe 16 to 18 times a minute. I'm good, thanks. It's going to let you take, it'll cancel out any ventilations I was going to provide to you, and it'll let you breathe over my ventilator. Okay, and the last one is just CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Okay, so we're going to move past that. All right, with all intubated and ventilated patients, listen up. You must know your settings. I will ask you. I have your clinical instructors who will ask you. You must know these. Absolutely must. You must know your VAP preventions, ventil ventilatory acquired pneumonia, VAP. How do we prevent this? You must know that we suction Q2 hours. We suction the ET tube itself, and we also suction the patient's mouth around the gums, the oropharynx, and the nasopharynx if need be. You're going to be sedated, and you're going to be intubated while you're intubated. So I'm going to manage that with three main medications. Okay, and my three main sedation management drugs are going to be fentanyl, Versed, and propofol. P R O P Pro Po P O F O L Propofol. So, fentanyl is my opioid. We use it for pain management during intubation or sedation. My benzodiazepine sedative hypnotic is going to be Versed, and my short-term acting hypnotic slash sedative is going to be Propofol. It's important to remember. That yes, you could be drawing lipid profiles on patients with propofol, but you don't have to in the short term. Okay, there's this big debate, and you can go look it up for yourself. Uh, but there's a big debate, and people get really upset. And they're like, oh, we should be drawing, uh, you know, lipid panels on patients that are on propofol. And that is partially true. It's good to draw these levels because propofol actually has calories inside of it going directly into your veins, and they should be considered, especially by dietary. That being said, these are, propofol by itself will not elevate lipid panels unless it's being used for prolonged periods of time. If you have patients on a ventilator for one, two, three, four, five days, it's not going to impact lipid levels at all. You're not going to see a measurement. Okay, so just be aware. Monitoring lipids may be a consideration. It may be something your 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 physician or provider wants to do. Just be aware of it. Why? Prevent infection. If you're intubated, you must be at 45 degrees, 30 to 45 degrees. I prefer my patients a little higher, actually. Okay. That being said, there are some innovative patients we cannot sit up for various reasons, and, and again, that's that's fine. There are circumstances where that does occur. We have to lay the bed flat, and that does happen. Okay. Do yourself a favor, and one of the biggest things I hate seeing right now in the clinical setting is that people are terrified of extubating their patients. They're scared of it, and I don't blame them. 
COVID was a uh, interesting experience to say the least. We got really good at innovating people. We did not get good at extubating them because they typically died on the ventilator, um, which is very sad, very unfortunate, no doubt about it. But it left a void in terms of education and experience with a lot of newer nurses, especially in the ICU, where they're like, oh, how do I get this out of you? How do I get this tube out of you? What do I do? You know, or they got nervous when the minute their patient started gagging, coughing, trying to extubate themselves. So they'd resedate them and leave them for somebody else. The problem is that's one vicious cycle that we don't know where it's going to stop. And that's not the correct care the patient needs. A patient should be extubated as soon as humanly possible if medically safe. Okay, and you may have to get creative. Extubation is not a one size fits all, one shoe fits all for, for patients. And you, even your, your physician uh, we've had some newer pulmonologists, we've had newer intensivists come through the ICU that they're even a little like, oh man, they're fighting back really hard. Oh, those numbers are scaring me. But you got to look at the patient. If the patient's not tachypnic and they're not in severe distress, you can look at their cardiac values, so their heart rate, their, their blood pressure. If they're not in severe distress and they're just upset they have a tube down their throat, and by the way, I think you would be too, then we're going to try and move forward with the testing, the appropriate testing, spontaneous breathing trials, to get a patient extubated. But that's a big deal. Okay, we'll talk about it more. Pepticles of prevention, okay, or prophylaxis. So this is where you need to be. If you're ventilated, you've got to be on Pepsid. You've got to be on Protonics, one of the two. Chlorhexidine oral care. We're going to suction the oral pharynx and the tube every two hours. We're also going to provide chlorhexidine. Uh, a lot of the, by the way, there's still hospitals that sometimes utilize uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide-based uh, cleansers. So just be aware of that as well. So the ones we use here at St. Mary's in Apple Valley, chlorhexidine rinses, uh, they kill bacteria in the mouth and prevent growth, especially of like fungal uh, properties. And then DVT prophylaxis in the form of either uh, low molecular weight heparin, a thinner aspirin, um, anti, or excuse me, um, uh, compression stockings, SCDs. Those are all things that must be, because these patients are sedated, they aren't moving. They will form clots. Do not let them. Okay. So let's talk just really quickly about weaning. Okay. Weaning is not one size fits all. I've said it again. So you have to look at your PF ratio. Okay. What I mean by that is you have to look at your partial oxygenation. So your PaO2 in your, in your arterial blood gases. And you have to look at your FiO2. Okay. And what we're looking at is for a value greater than 400 on your PF ratio. So what happens is during that spontaneous breathing trial, we allow the patient to breathe X amount of times on their own with incredibly limited or even sometimes no support. Okay. And we see how they not only tolerate it, but we also then look at the results, say after 30 minutes to 60 minutes, depending on which physician ordered, we look at what impact that type of breathing had on the arterial blood gas and we draw it. And when we drive, we get a really good idea of, hey, you know, yes, they oxygenated well, they're blowing off CO2, our pH is good, no bicarb necessary for compensation, things look fantastic, cool, let's extubate them. Well, kind of. Or no, they started breathing, they got tachypnic, shallow breaths, they got worked up, they got freaked out, they, just, they, they got hypercarbic, they got a little hypoxic, a blood gas became acidic, you know, bicarb started to compensate. All right, we're not going to extubate you. Not yet. I need to get you a little bit calmer. Okay, because the worst thing that can happen is you extubate the patient. They go right back into respiratory failure, acute respiratory failure specifically, and you have to re-intubate your patient because you risk airway trauma every time you intubate. Some intubations are easy. You drop the laryngoscope down, boom. See the vocal cords? Open, slide, tube, done. There are some innovations that are incredibly challenging and trauma to the pharynx, larynx, oropharynx, trachea can occur. So the less that we have to innovate, the better. Okay. So we have the RSBI, Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. Okay. Uh, so what we're looking at here is our respiratory rate divided by liters of volume. All right. So liters. And again, normal liters for somebody just breathing right now, 12 to 20 times a minute, 500 tidal volume. It's going to be 6,000 to 10,000 mLs or 6 to 10 liters. So you divide your respiratory rate. Okay, so I, I took 20 breaths per minute per se. And let's say I had 10 liters. Okay, so what the rapid shallow breathing index is looking at is for a value below 50. Okay, below 50, I'll say it again. 
Now, different pulmonologists and different interventionists look at these values and they say, they look at a big picture. All right, well, what if it is above 50? I don't love that, okay? But if it's below 100 and above 50, the patient's still weanable if I go back and look at my PF ratio and I say, hey, you know what? I'm sitting around 390, 400, 410. Okay, I've got a RSBI of 78, 75. My cuff leak test is negative, um, or excuse me, uh, 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 positive. Uh, so I have a good leak down of 100 to 10 mLs or less. Okay, so what I'm looking at here is the bigger picture saying, can they breathe adequately on their own? Are they at risk for airway compromise? Will I rehab to intubate? And so again, I look at the RSBI and I say, all right, Normal is 50 and below, 50 to 100 is acceptable. 105 and above, you're straight up, absolutely, by itself, the value would indicate we still need to maintain intubation slash mechanical, mechanical ventilation. So, lastly, lastly is a cuff leak test, okay? So what we're assessing for is the amount of volume of air, so we're going to deflate that cuff attached to the endotracheal tube, and we're actually going to assess for how much or how many mLs, okay, passes by the tube when we do so. The idea is we need 110 ml, 110, excuse me, let me try that one more time. We need volumes of less than 110 mLs or less than 12 to 24% of the volume delivered to ensure airway patency. Okay, and this might sound confusing, let me clarify. What we're actually assessing is whether or not they're going to have any kind of laryngeal or uh, tracheal spasms when we pull this tube out. Okay. If we deflate that cuff, there should be a good diameter around the cuff in which air can pass by and up and out the mouth or nose. If we deflate that cuff and we do a leak down test, okay, or a cuff leak test, and that value keeps coming back lower and lower and lower and lower, what that's telling me is the airway is actually, despite the balloon being deflated, is clamping down around the tube because I'm having spasms or constrictions in the airway. Sometimes a pulmonologist will say, you know what, it's okay, let's go ahead and extubate them anyway, and let's get an order for racemic epi, or inhaled epinephrine. Okay. Whereas in other instances, doctors will say, you know what, I don't like that. Let's go ahead and take a different prophylactic measure. Let's get them on steroids and let's get a PRN for some epi in the event we do extubate. But this test, if it comes back and, you know, you have decreasing values and volumes moving past the, the airway, okay, we are concerned for that because, again, bronchospasms or constriction, not bronco, airway spasms or constrictions are occurring. Okay, let's talk about ALI, ALI and ARDS really quick, okay? So when we talk about acute lung injury, okay, or acute, or, or, or sorry, ARDS, along with ALI, we're talking about something that has been caused by either trauma, a bacterial or viral infection, sepsis, or even pancreatitis, which is one of the few kind of unique stars here. Diagnostic criteria, difficulty breathing, fast breathing, refractory hypoxemia. Chest x-ray will show infiltrates. It looks like snow, or it looks like a whiteout throughout the lung. Okay, it looks like there was no snow in the lung before, and now it snowed. AVGs, refractory hypoxia with respiratory alkalosis, meaning our pH would be above 7.45. Okay, we would have decreased carbon dioxide. Tracheoplasma protein ratios, we will look at that as well. So if we look at AL, acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome, we're looking at a couple things. We're looking at a couple values to indicate these. So if I have an acute onset with persistent hypoxemia and oxygenation criteria, a PA, a partial oxygen fraction uh, with fraction of inspired oxygen, being less than 300, then I would be considered ALI territory. A PaO2 with a FiO2 subtraction down to less than 200 would be indicative of, of acute respiratory distress symptom. So how do we exclude? How do we delineate? How do we define? Well, a partial wedge pressure of 18 or greater, okay, would be indicative. A presence of arterial hypertension also and a radiographic criteria, bilateral opacities in the chest x-rays, all of those would be indicative of 
either ALI or ARDS. But when we look at this oxygenation criteria, again, PaO2 divided by FiO2, less than 300 ALI, less than 200, it's going to be ARDS. I will not quiz you on this, okay, but I do need you to be aware of what it is. This is a fantastic example of what's actually occurring inside the alveolus at time of ARDS onset and duration. So we have our normal alveolus, space, air, type 2 cells, surfactant all along the inside. We have exchange, things look great. 